welcome to the latest edition of Hardman Talks. Uh, my name is Mark Thomas. I'm the Banks Analyst here at Hardman & Co. Uh, I'm delighted today that we're joined by the management of BNorth, namely Jonathan Thompson, the Chief Executive, and David Broadbent, the Chief Financial Officer, and they will be making a presentation. With that, I'll hand over to Jonathan and David. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and uh, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're here to tell you a little bit more about uh, B North, soon to be Bank North. My name is Jonathan Thompson, as, uh, as Mark said, and we're on the cusp of launching the first genuinely regional SME bank in the UK for many decades. And it's an exciting combination of the traditional and the modern in banking, combining cloud banking technology with a very authentic regional model. Before we get going, I'll just hand over to Dave just to introduce some of the uh, transaction detail and economics, and then we'll move on to the uh, to the main part of the presentation. Dave, over to you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so, yeah, the purpose of this webinar is to introduce our series A raise to potential investors. Uh, the series A is the raise that we're doing to enable us to get the regulatory capital we need for our UK banking license. More of that in the main body of the presentation. Um, so we're raising 20 million pounds. It's pre-money of 25 million. Um, it's fair to say the raise is already well advanced. Uh, we have just under 18 million of the 20 committed. Uh, so that means there's there's two million um, for potential investors to participate in uh, with a minimum investment of 100,000 um, pounds. In terms of the 18 million commitments, investors coming into this round will be sat alongside some very high quality investors. Uh, we've provided some details of that on this slide. It includes a, a Northern European banking group, pension fund manager and a, a UK PRA regulated entity. Obviously you can see the other details. In terms of uh, exit strategy and returns for investors, um, so our core intention is to list the business via an IPO within five years. And in terms of projected returns, those are based on an expected valuation of the business by 2028 of 1.6 billion. Uh, this assumes profitability of 150 million pounds per annum and a multiple of that of 10.7 times, which we see as being very conservative when compared to other relevant transactions, some of which we've included on this slide. And that means for investors in this Series A round, the expected returns money on money will be over 13 times, and that translates into an annualized return of between 35 and 40%. So I'll hand back to Jonathan and we'll start the main body of the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Um, so just by way of uh, a few sort of more formal introductions. So uh, as we mentioned, my name is Jonathan Thompson. In terms of my background, uh, it started off with doing structured finance with Lloyd's Banking Group, working in the UK and in the EU, then with Deloitte in its corporate finance and debt capital advisory business uh, across the last downturn, actually across the last global financial crisis. And uh, I was with then Santander for nearly a decade latterly as a divisional managing director in, uh, in Santander UK's SME Bank. And I think it's there where I experienced firsthand a number of the challenges that uh, scale incumbents face when serving the uh, SME segment in the UK. Dave? Yes, so Dave Broadbent, Chief Financial Officer. Um, so I started my career at PwC as F 10 years, but then spent the bulk of my career at International Personal Finance. So. <laughs> A, an, an unsecured consumer lending business operating in emerging markets. Uh, I was there for 17 years. I was the FD of that business for 11 years, including when it listed on the main London Stock Exchange in 2007. And latterly, the last two years there, I was Chief Commercial Officer, uh, running a, a large transformation program and also setting up what is now their IPF digital arm. Thanks, Dave. And uh, you'll see there Ron Emerson's uh, picture. Ron is our chairman. And uh, due to the regulatory nature of banking and our business, that we've got an extremely high quality uh, independent board of which Ron is chair. He's got a stellar banking career at Bank of America, Standard Chartered, and uh, was founding chair of the uh, British Business Bank, as well as having been a senior advisor to the, uh, to the Bank of England. And alongside Dave and I, who are a team of around 25 execs with, uh, with deep experience of startup and scale-up banking, counting amongst them Atom, Oak North, 
uh, Metro Bank and many others. So this is a team that has, uh, has been on this journey before. Uh, we've also just appointed uh, recently a further independent non-executive director in Namisha Patel. Namisha works for the uh, Cabinet Office as Chief Information Officer and brings a, a welcome technology angle to our uh, independent board team as well. So um, look, at the, at the heart of, uh, of B North is, uh, is a business that's built on um, very robust market fundamentals. And at the cornerstone of that is a very significant uh, stock of SME lending, uh, around 150 billion in the UK. And this has been very poorly served by the UK incumbents. And whilst there's been a lot of innovation around provision of short-term unsecured credit for, uh, for SMEs, particularly the micro SMEs, the likes of Starling, Iwaka and Cabbage being able to deliver uh, chunks of uh, lending of around 50K very efficiently. The domain of secured lending is predominantly with the big banks who have around 70% of that market. And they're simply not set up to deliver loans economically. And uh, over the last decade or so, we've been pursuing a very cost-driven strategy, uh, which is incumbent on outdated infrastructure and legacy technology. And it's also heavily centralized which leads to slow and bureaucratic outcomes for SMEs. Um, four months is the average it takes to, uh, to complete a secured loan facility with your banks. And many SMEs are now more likely to be managed through call centers than having a traditional relationship manager in the locality. So a bit about why Bank North is, is here and uh, what the opportunity is. We're a business that's designed from scratch by experts with extensive uh, SME sector knowledge. And we're combining the best people with the latest and best cloud native banking technology. And in doing so, create a very scalable and profitable business, which carries with it clear unit economics. Uh, we're building a business designed to deliver at pace. So to take that four month customer journey and uh, improve that by a factor of 10 to around two weeks in terms of delivery. And uh, we're a business that has very deep knowledge of the uh, broker channel in the UK. That's a very exciting channel, which has become a poor, core permanent part of uh, the landscape for SME finance. And no one has considered that channel in more detail in terms of our peers and uh, will embrace it in such a strategic manner. We'll come back to that later in the, uh, in the presentation. And as the slide says there, um, we're on the cusp of uh, securing our banking license, which is contingent only on completion of this Series A funding round. Uh, and that allows us to access very efficient capital and compete, compete across the market. As the slide says here, we're a fintech enabled bank. It's only been possible to host a bank using cloud native banking technology since 2016. And that's important because it effectively renders competitors, the incumbents and earlier stage challenges, all with legacy physical uh, IT uh, technology and infrastructure. Uh, we're working with the market leaders in cloud native banking technology, and we're taking those platforms and then we've heavily bespoked those for our own model and to serve the needs of the UK SME market. So we spent around 5,000 Mondays creating and bespoking our platform. That pl platform is now fully integrated, it's fully tested and is ready to launch, as is the business on the uh, savings side as well. And the technology that you'll see that some of our partners listed on this slide also helps us to uh, make better informed lending decisions, presenting very high quality information to our underwriters and allowing to monitor exposures intelligently once a facility is drawn down. So it's very much a business that is technologically speaking, ready to, ready to go, fully tested, fully integrated, uh, built and ready to launch. I mentioned at the start, we've got a very authentic regional model. And uh, at the heart of this is our pod operating model. So we're effectively, we've built a market leading cloud native banking platform, and we effectively leverage that uh, with a physical manifestation of our business in the form of our regional pods. SMEs are regional and for secured debt in particular, they expect regional delivery. So uh, our first pod will be in Manchester and then we'll expand regionally across the UK, 
growing to around eight pods to give us full regional coverage. And this regional model is something that's very much in tune with the wider political agenda towards regionalization and the leveling up of the UK. And it's also a model that recognizes the importance of people in the uh, secured lending market. If you're an SME owner and you're pledging the keys to your warehouse as collateral for a loan, a personal relationship built on trust is very important. It's a critical part of the, uh, the lending decision, uh, both for the borrower and indeed for the lender who wants to be able to meet borrowers and really get under the skin of the business and, uh, and what makes it tick. Um, within each of our pods is the end-to-end -end lending journey. So that includes first-line, front-line colleagues facing off both to brokers, to intermediaries and direct to borrowers. Within each of those pods, we have underwriters as well who are making the lending decisions. They're making those decisions close to the borrowers rather than centralized in, uh, in most other banks. We also have valuation professionals who allow us to deliver that end-to-end -end customer journey in a very seamless way by in-housing the, uh, the valuation of collateral. And our technology platform can uh, deliver the core legal documentation required to, uh, to document a, a loan facility with a bank uh, straight away. So that act slickens up the uh, legal delivery of, uh, of loan facilities. We have a clear rollout plan, as I mentioned, and the team is in place for our first pod in Manchester. So our aim is effectively to complete this funding round, uh, unlock the banking license, and then we aim to be lending within weeks of, uh, of unlocking that banking license and, uh, and starting trading, taking the business post revenue. I mentioned uh, the importance of the broker channel within the UK and Bank North has been designed with that large and growing broker channel very much in mind and as a core permanent strategic part of our proposition. Over the last 10 years, particularly since the global financial crisis, there's been a significant structural shift uh, in that once an SME would have had a relationship with his uh, or her local bank manager, now an SME is more likely to have a, a relationship with a broker. Brokers are typically regional and have grown to fill the gap created by those retrenching incumbent banks. And it just so happens that brokers are heavily reliant on regional networks and personal relationships, which is something our pod model lends itself directly to. The number of brokers has doubled in the, in, in the last 10 years in the UK. And uh, in 2020, it was a channel that delivered 26 billion of debt placed into uh, banks and alternative finance providers. So I think you'll agree it's become a very important part of the SME lending uh, landscape. And we've been working with brokers since the outset here at Bank North, and we've developed a very unique and differentiated proposition for them, anchored by a, a commission model that creates a real genuine alignment uh, with, uh, with the brokers. So effectively that scene that sees us paying an on-market uh, commission payment at completion of a loan facility and uniquely in the term lending market an annuity to that broker over the life of the loan whilst that's performing subject to them uh, sustaining high standards of conduct and working in partnership uh, with, uh, with Bank North. Working with brokers is, is very important for us because we have a very efficient uh, regional coverage model that's enabled by the technology that we, we have, which sees us having a cost income ratio uh, less than half of the UK banking sector average. And working with these brokers gives us access to a very significant distribution uh, channel, but gives us that access on a variableized basis. So we only pay when brokers are introducing uh, performing assets into, into Bank North. And that makes it a very relevant channel uh, for, for us. We've done extensive market testing within the channel, and uh, that's evidenced the, uh, the, the alignment that Bank North has to those brokers, being local, being easy to deal with. And our market testing has shown us that our, our price is competitive, enabled by our, our banking license model, but also some uh, differentiators. The fact that we co-locate first line and second line within a regional context allows our teams to have very rich conversations about how best to support a business. And we can do some simple tailoring of finance provisions for SMEs to really un unlock uh, genuine differentiators, both for the brokers and for the borrower through, uh, through using our proposition. And it's a model that's very difficult to, uh, to replicate as well. So uh, we've worked very closely with the regulator 
to take them on that journey of uh, authentic regional delivery. And it means that we've, uh, we effectively have that regulatory traction in place, something that's very difficult to replicate with others. Dave, I'll pass on to you for the next slide. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. So as uh, Jonathan mentioned, our, our go-to-market operating model are, are those regional pods. And each one of those are, are very much empowered, autonomous, and their own P&L account. Um, and, uh, and we, based on our modeling, we expect each one of those businesses to, uh, to generate and, and build a, a loan book of around 550 million within sort of six years of opening. Now, just to talk about that loan book briefly, so our product set, principally five-year commercial term loans, some other products in there as well. So some buy to let, some development finance and bridging as well. Um, average ticket size, probably a million pounds, we think. Um, so it's, it's a relatively low volume, high value, but then also sort of high profitability um, segment of the lending market. So in simple terms, we'll be lending at around five and a half percent. Our borrowing costs might be around so sort of one to one and a half percent. So a net interest margin of just over four percent, or or looking at another way, sort of a, a gross gross margin of about eight percent on all the lending we're doing. And in the early years, all of that lending will be secured on on real estate or or collateral that's as, as secure as real estate, with uh, probably an, a, a loan to value ratio of uh, around 60, 65 percent. So um, lots of downside protect, protection in in that loan book. Um, but in terms of once you work that through in terms of unit economics, for every single pod, as I say, we expect them to build up that loan book of 550 million, net interest margin around 4%. And that means that each one at maturity should be able to generate an annual profit or contribution to the bank profit of 20 million pounds per annum each. Um, each one should be able to move into profitability within 16 months of opening. So a very short and shallow J curve. Um, as you multiply eight pods through for the business, we expect the, the bank to move into profitability by year three, go on to generate profits in excess of 150 million. Based on those eight pods, there might be opportunities to open more than that, uh, but also generate a return on equity of over 20% and have a cost income ratio that will be well below sort of half the average of, of, of UK banks. Um, you know, eight pods, 550 million each. So that's a balance sheet or a loan book of between four and five billion. Uh, that needs funding. And our primary source of funding will be retail deposits, uh, which you can only access if you are a regulated bank. Now, a banking license, a very valuable asset, very rare asset as well. In terms of its value, let's say the UK retail deposit market is worth 1.3 trillion. Um, so it's a very large and sustainable pool of funding that we can access to scale up the business, its operations and balance sheet. It's also a relatively low cost source of funding. Um, so one of our core deposit products might be a one year fixed term bond. Typical pricing on that would be just over 1%. Uh, if we went to the wholesale market to secure funding, we might be paying for 4 to 5% in the current market. So a very big difference in that, that cost of funds for us. And that means that we've got a significant advantage over non-bank lenders from a pure pricing perspective. And it also means with that low cost of funding, we can target a very broad segment of UK SMEs to lend to. So as I say, very valuable asset, but also a very rare asset as well. So it can take several years to obtain a banking license. It's a very thorough process. We've included some of this official statistics on this on the, on the right-hand side. If you can see them in Zoom, uh, what it says is that since 2013, uh, over 100 entities have tried to obtain a bank license, but less than 20% of them are successful, which indicates what a tough process it is. Um, thankfully, we've successfully navigated that. You know, we've been told by the regulators that the only condition we need to satisfy now is the regulatory capital, which is the Series A we're here to talk about. More importantly, it's probably worth noting that the PRA and the FCA, they, they have told us that we've submitted one of the best applications they've ever seen, which we're very proud of. But more importantly, uh, they said that they do see Bank North as being an important addition to the supply side of credit to UK SMEs. And I think just to reiterate a point that Jonathan made, once we complete this round and we secure the bank license, we are very much ready to go. 
teams in place, technologists in place, and we will be lending within weeks of obtaining the bank license, starting in, in our Manchester pod, serving the Northwest, and, and fixing a, what is a big problem for UK SMEs at a time when they need funding solutions more than ever. Um, for good order, um, we've got the detail of our investor email for follow-up questions or uh, other correspondence after this. But now that concludes the formal part of the presentation. And we'll hand back to Mark, who will give us a good grilling with your questions. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. The first one is, will B North Lend UK-wide before the regional hubs are established? Yeah, thank you, Mark, and thank you for the, uh, for the question. Um, the, the, the answer is um, that it'll be a bias towards the regions that the pod is, uh, is set up in. So there may be occasions when we lend outside of that region, but uh, we've, we've, within the team, we've got a lot of experience of uh, that startup phase of, of banks. And there is uh, there's certainly lessons that have been learnt from other places within, uh, within our team. So the aim of that is to, to run a very controlled rollout of the business. And it will be stay reasonably true and authentic to that, uh, to that regional model. So in the early part of our balance sheet evolution, there'll be a bias towards the, the Northwest. And then we, uh, we continue to roll out in accordance with our rollout uh, plan over the first couple of years. So uh, the aim is to, in each year, open three three of those regional pods. So we very quickly actually gain that sort of um, uh, national momentum, but it's done in a, in a controlled manner. Great, thank you. Uh, you obviously uh, you know, highlighted the, you know, the BOCA relationships, uh, but could you say a bit more about how you differentiate from other SME or neo SME banks like Alicia or Recognise that already have their banking licences? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and uh, you're you're right. I think the the questioner there highlights uh, a couple of the more recent uh, entrants into the uh, into the SME lending landscape in Alica and uh, and Recognise, and. Um, what I would say is that B North has a few quite key differentiators. Um, so we've considered the SME market in great detail, and actually, I've spent a lot of time over the last two two and a half years refining our proposition, working with brokers, and uh, and developing our technology as well. So we're actually, from a mobilisation of the bank perspective, in a very advanced advanced state probably more advanced than most are in, in our situation. So um, I'd highlight a few differentiators. Firstly, our model, our regional model is a very authentic regional model. So this isn't just about putting business development individuals uh, in key locations across the UK. Each of our pods is almost like a, a mini, mini bank. So a bit dedicated to that region. So it has frontline teams facing off direct to borrowers and to brokers as local regional underwriting capability. So that's second line within the region as well as that in-house uh, valuation capability. So all of that is very authentic. It enables us to deliver much more quicker, quickly than the, than the traditional banks are. So we've spent a lot of time um, bespoking the technology, as I mentioned, but also looking at the process of lending to give us control over that end-to-end -end journey designed to deliver that process significantly quicker than the incumbents and to deliver that repeatedly. So this isn't something that is, isn't a bank that has to go upscale to, to, uh, to grow its balance sheets. We can remain very loyal to the SME segment as we grow and scale up the business. I think the final point I've mentioned is the, uh, is the broker model. So that's a proposition that has been developed very closely with um, local brokers who've invested in the business. And we've also worked with the with the broker industry bodies at NACFB and FIBA as well. So we're quite excited about that part of the proposition. It's, a, it's enabled by having fully integrated technology, which allows us to track the performance of individual loan facilities introduced by brokers. So it enables that very authentic and aligned uh, commission structure for brokers that we're, uh, we're working alongside. So I would say, very authentic, very considered proposition that is very tuned to the regional uh, regional banking model. And the fact we've got North in our title, we're very proud of our Northern underpinnings. And I think it's important to have a, an authentic regional lens when looking at the, uh, the requirements of uh, the regional SME banking segment. 
Great, thank you. What is the likely impact of the recent flood of government guaranteed lending on future demand and the timing of future demand? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so what we've seen over the last um, last 12 months in particular is a, 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 a preponderance of uh, C-bills and bounce back loans being delivered into the market. And that was part of the reason that the, uh, the volume of broker activity actually increased in 2020 to buy around six billion on the, on the year before. So that liquidity has gone into the market. We have a, um, that, that eventually will need some form of, uh, of refinancing. And also there's quite a bit of BAU uh, refinancing that just wasn't undertaken in 2020 because banks have been quite strained from a resource perspective in managing C-bills and delivering C-bills but also working with businesses that are going through a significant period of stress. So the, the indicators are all that uh, the level of uh, refinance and, and new growth capital activity over the coming period will be quite, quite significant. And uh, one of the advantages of the, uh, the SME lending segment is that that sort of capital, the, the debt capital refinances typically every two to five years. So there's a constant flow of, uh, of opportunity looking for homes uh, within, the, uh, within the banking segment. Certainly, the, a lot of businesses have had to um, refinance in what is a period of stress. So we, as, a, as an early stage bank, have to be quite selective in the businesses that we support because we have one very close eye on the, on the credit quality and uh, diversification of our asset book. What I would say is that our regional model puts us in a perfect position to, uh, to be quite selective, but to, uh, to really get under the skin of the, of the businesses that we're looking to support. We can meet management, management can meet us, we can make very um, robust assessment of the quality of management, how they've reacted to the last 12 months and how they've managed their businesses through that period. So that we, we think we're in a very strong position to be able to, uh, to select the, uh, the winners and to, uh, to support the recovery of the UK as it comes out of uh, what has been a very challenging economic period. Yeah, Jonathan, it's probably worth also note. So what we're seeing is a lot of the incumbent lenders have become very introspective. Uh, so the sort of nursing loan portfolios that have been impaired as a result of events of the last 12 months. And I think you saw, so you, you see some parallels with what's happening today with what you saw at Santander, sort of post the global financial crisis. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a good point, Dave. And uh, certainly I joined uh, Santander in 2009. So post GFC 2008, and um, it effectively, what, what, it's, a, it's an interesting time to be growing a, an asset book because effectively there's quite a bit of liquidity has been withdrawn from the market over the past 12 months. So we've seen a number of fund lenders, so non-bank licensed lenders, who've had to stall or actually withdraw from the market, um, uh, which has taken some liquidity out of the market. At the same time, there's been a... Uh, an undoubted correction in the in underlying um, real estate asset values, particularly commercial real estate. So all that means that it, it is an opportunity to lend into a, a market that has gone through some form of correction in terms of collateral and in terms of the, uh, the amount of liquidity in the market as well. So um, when I was at Santander, that was a, a, a very interesting period. And it's actually a window that stays open for longer than you might expect. Certainly, um, the four or five years post-global financial crisis were very high, a time of writing very high-quality business that stayed on that balance sheet as a high-quality vintage for almost the decade I was there. So it represents a really interesting market reset and market entry point. Good point there. Great. Um, can you give some more details on the retail deposit initiatives? Depositors have lots of options to choose from, so why would they pick Bank North? Well, well I'll, I will try and tell you why. Um, so, the, so it's probably worth saying a couple of structural things. So, um, so what we're not doing, certainly in phase one, is operating a current account model. Um, so current accounts come with sort of a high administrative cost and, you know, tend to be very sticky. You know, and current account inertia is well known. You know, uh, we've seen other banks throw lots of money at it and very difficult to get people to transfer their their core current account activity. Um, so our strategy is primarily one of fixed term bonds. Um, these will be administered on our behalf by 
Newcastle Strategic Solutions. They are the UK's market leading white label provider of, of deposit services. So they, I think they, they manage about 26 billion of deposits and, and on their client list, I think there's 14 other UK banks. So, you know, they, they take the, the stress out of that activity for us so we can focus on the lending opportunity, which is where we see, you know, significant value creation. In terms of that fixed bond strategy, Mark, so typically they might be one, two, three, four, five year bonds. Um, at the minute, because interest rates are so low, they tend to be short tenor, you know, might be one or two year bonds. Um, and obviously as a bank, one of the things that, that our depositors have the benefit of is the financial services compensation scheme guarantee up to 85,000 pounds. And therefore, that means that there's a whole swathe of depositors in the UK that are simply looking to place chunks of their money with those that provide the highest rates. So the typical strategy is even with a, a brand that may not be very well known, if you're in the top three of the best buy tables, which might be you know, money supermarket or th that type or in the, you know, the, the money section of the Sunday Times, then there's a long track record of new to market banks that have raised substantial amounts of money with that strategy. So actually in terms of sort of building the balance sheet, we're very relaxed about the ability to, to raise deposits. And as I say, focus on creating, rolling out the pod network and, and building the, uh, the loan book. Okay, uh, we've got a, a top and a tail question really around, around, from an investment point of view. Uh, if I want to invest, how do I go about it? So that's sort of going in. And yeah, your, first on your chart, you highlighted 2028 valuations as the target exit multiple. Yeah, but you're obviously talking about an exit before that. So can you tell us a bit more about yeah, when they may, when we may reasonably get the investment back? Yeah, um, so in terms of um, if people are interested in investing, um, then I think we flashed up the, um, sort of the email address to sort of ping, ping through an email. So that's investor at bnorth.co.uk. Um, I'm sure uh, the Hardman team will be able to uh, make that visible and available. Um, but I think it's on our website as well. So ni nice nice and easy, and, and that's the, the easiest route. And yes, you know, in terms of sort of from an exit perspective, yeah, you know, we've, um, we've tried to be very transparent and sort of laying, laying out our accountability for, it, for a seven year sort of model, you know, from this year through to the end of 2028. Obviously, the you know in terms of exit, um, you know the IPO we've identified as the route that is most within our control. Um, we think that that's most likely within within five years. Um, probably for us, the key the the key timing for that is when the business has moved into profitability. So, I'd say that would be sort of around 20, 2024, um, something like that. And as those profits develop, I think you know that's probably an opportune moment. You know, the IPO may well be linked to sort of the last substantial capital raise that we would need to to deliver that plan. Um, and obviously, we you know we've we've already raised ten million of of, uh, of investments so far. That's primarily from individual in investors. And Jonathan and I, you know, and, and and the other and the other management team who have all invested, you know, we're conscious that liquidity is really important to to individual private investors. And that's why, so that, that listing is, uh, obviously we can't be precise on timing, but that's certainly a, a commitment for us to deliver on that. Okay, so that led to an immediate follow-up. How much have you invested? I don't know if that's you <laughs> personally, or if you're taking yeah, time on so, the team. Yeah. Yeah. No, in, in, in terms of um, sort of the board and the exec team, uh, we've invested, so we've raised 10, 10 million so far, and over 2 million of that has come from, from within the business. Uh, not just ourselves, but our friends and our family. Um, so ne never mind the high quality Series A investors, Mrs. Thompson and Mrs. Broadbent are shareholders, and they're far more demanding than uh, <laughs> the capital people. So um, yes, you'll be you'll be sitting alongside some very very demanding investors that will uh, hold us to account all the way through. It's a very uncertain world. What will you do if volumes disappoint? And what comfort can you give that you're not going to chase volumes and, and take on rubbish business? Shall I go first, Dave, or do you, do you want to go first? I think I, 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 let, me, let me pick up on the, the volume thing, and okay. then you pick up on the, um, so the uh, quality part of it. So I think first thing to say, Mark, and obviously I would say this, we have absolutely no doubts about the ability 
deliver the volumes in the plan. And one of the things that makes us so confident about that is the market testing exercise that Jonathan referred to. You know, so we've used that broker channel. We've been able to get details of live transactions over the last sort of 12 to 18 months that have been in the market. We've been able to sort of assess those in, from a risk perspective and offer indicative terms. And then the brokers you know, told us whether we'd win that business or not. And the success rate from that has been way ahead of our expectations and would deliver volumes in excess of those that we've assumed in the plan. So having said all of that, you know, I think it's probably important to note that um, a couple of things. One, so we've got our initial product set that we've laid out. Um, and John, Jonathan referred to the broker channel delivering about 20 billion of lending per year. The product set that we've got would cater for about two thirds of that business. There are two natural products that fit into that broker channel that we've not put in our day one product set, but very logical product extensions for us to factor in during the lifetime of the plan, namely invoice discounting and, and asset backed lending. So effectively non real estate lending. So I think that there are certain product extensions that are not built into the plan that are always available to turn on. Secondly, we've only assumed eight regional pods. Uh, my personal belief is that, you know, to cover the UK, there'll be opportunities to uh, deliver the eight and then go further than that. So there are some very major parts of the country or major cities that are not in that initial roster. So we'll tackle the northwest from, from Manchester. But for example, you know, Liverpool has got a thriving business community that uh, so likes to do business with, with Liverpool based businesses. So somewhere like that could be a easily be a ninth pod or whatever else. And then it's also worth saying that we see the pod model as being very simple, cookie cutter, very replicable. SME lending is not by, uh, as a norm, regulated in international markets. So one of the first things that Ron Emerson uh, asked Jonathan when he came on board as chair is like, you know, what's the long-term plan? He was formerly chair of a Dutch bank and he said, look, this is a universal problem across across the whole world. It's not just, you know, specific to the UK. Um, and, you know, we see that pod model as something that could definitely extend across UK boundaries and into Europe and other markets at the right point in time. We need to sort of focus on the initial pod rollout, move those first ones into profitability, but then I think there are certainly other opportunities to build scale in the business. And last but not least, before I'm back to Jonathan, what we know is that over the last 12 to 18 months, there are lots of SME loan portfolios that are causing problems for sort of the lenders that are sat with them. Obviously, over the next 12 to 18 months, you'll get true visibility on how those loan books have performed. And for some lenders, there will be a desire to sort of remove those portfolios from their balance sheet and reallocate their capital to something different. So there may well be consolidation opportunities as the business evolves, you know, in terms of loan book portfolios that could be an accelerator to growth. And, and just to pick up on the, the second part of that question, thanks, Mark. Um, so this isn't a model that's about chasing volume. Um, there's, the, the market is very significant. The, the, the 150 billion number that I quoted, is just businesses turning over up to 25 million. There's more above that as well. So it's a very significant and very underserved market opportunity and we're getting regular inquiries almost daily from uh, from brokers asking uh, what our timing is for for launch and uh, and just bouncing thoughts around with us so we we've got an opportunity to be very selective and um there's a lot of sme lending expertise around our leadership uh, table and within the uh, within the business itself so it's about being selective and and taking our time to select the winners in uh, in what is obviously quite a complex uh, economic backdrop. So the, uh, the lending objectives in the context of the market opportunity are extremely modest indeed. And I think over the first five years, uh, we envisage uh, requiring about 2% of that uh, market to deliver the, the plan in its entirety. So I wouldn't want to be one of our early customers because the diligence that will be applied to, uh, to our lending activity will be quite significant. We're, we're very aware of the fact that we want to build a downside protected diversified asset book uh, with uh, high quality credit underpinning it. And uh, mm -hmm. that comes uh, as a core part of the uh, of the business. Sorry, Dave. 
Yeah, Jonathan, I was just going to a couple of things. So I think you alluded earlier. So in terms of the pod, obviously we'll have the frontline bankers that will manage customer relations and bring business in. But then the underwriting and the, the loan sanction is done by an underwriter that sat in the second line. So as a bank, we have to have a full three lines of defense model. So there's separation between so those that are tasked with sort of growing the business and those that are tasked with managing risk and impairment, um, which is, you know, sort of a, if you're investing in any bank, that will be in place. And also, you know, it's probably worth noting that we've um, designed our sort of initial um, sort of remuneration and variable incentive packages. And they are, uh, so we have a, a formal remuneration committee that's, that's looked at all of this. And the, the, the sort of bonus and long-term incentive plan objectives are absolutely aligned to, yes, grow the business, but manage risk at the same time. So they are absolutely rock solid in terms of everybody knows that if there are any issues around quality, then there's no, there is no variable pay to pay. And so uh, we, you know, we're very happy that, and, they, and this is all in line with sort of PRA and European banking guidelines on how to set up remuneration structures to ensure that you don't incentivize rogue behavior. Okay. I mean, I think you've, you've already answered this, but I'll ask it just to, if the person who asked this question wants follow up, it's basically saying as a small business, how will you split? How will you make sure the risk controller isn't unduly influenced by the marketeer? So if the person who asked that question wants follow up, uh, just let me know. Um, you mentioned about lending in your presentation being very shortly after. Um, what's the time scale? When, when, when do you expect to start lending date wise? Yeah, so then there's so there, there's a, um, a sequence of events. Mark so said, you know, the um, we we need to, we we want to close this this round out, um, and obviously um, that's why we're presenting this as an opportunity today. Uh, we're aiming to close out within the next four to eight weeks, so that would be so around the the end of Q1, possibly early early April. Uh, in parallel, we're in discussion with the the PRA in terms of completing their final sign offs as well. Um, so, and then from a lending perspective, say all of the, the, the platform is, um, is there and the team's there. So within probably two months of, of obtaining the bank license, that's when we'll be lending. So probably end of, end of Q2 this year is sort of a, a, a reasonable time frame, you know, in terms of uh, when that will happen. Okay. I suspect this one's another one for David. Um, just to clarify, you've raised 10 million already. You're doing a 20 million raise now, of which you've got 18 million confirmed. How much capital will you need before you become self-sufficient? And uh, I presume, yeah, in terms of making enough profit to cover your growth. Oh crikey! Now, now that is a question. So, um, so as a business, the amount of capital we need is is driven by two key factors. So one, in, in this current stage as a startup, obviously we have startup losses that you know, we, we raise capital to cover. And, and as I said before, I think the, basically we'll, we'll have sort of two years of startup losses before moving to profitability. And then the other big driver effectively is the size of the loan book. So as a bank, we have regulatory capital requirements and, and over the long term probably means that uh, so circa 14% of our um, risk-weighted assets need to be held as, as capital buffers. Now, in terms of what that means to deliver the plan that we've laid out in the model on which the, the investor returns are, are based on, that assumes that over the life of the plan, we will raise around 300 million of capital. And obviously that, as I say, the vast majority of that is linked to the size of the balance sheet. So I have, Heaven forbid your question came true and we were struggling for volumes, we wouldn't need as much capital. Uh, but equally, if we're super successful, then uh, you know, as part of our IPO round, we might raise more than we'd originally anticipated. But the, the plan in, in broad terms has got about three, 300 million in it. And in terms of the capital required to move into profitability, um, you're probably looking at another 50 to 100 million af after this one. And then everything after that is purely to scale the balance sheet and profitability. Um, I suspect this one is for Jonathan. Um, yeah, how does being fintech enabled uh, differentiate you from a pure fintech bank? Yeah, that, that is a good question, uh, Mark. Uh, so thank you. Um, 
So th there's effectively two, two different aspects, but the first is primarily that a pure fintech, so a, a neobank as they're termed, exists solely in a, in, in a virtual world on, on an app. And uh, typically they will have proprietary technology, so they'll be based on their own coded, uh, coded platform and they'll have to invest and constantly innovate to, uh, to keep that current, to keep it compliant and, uh, and to uh, plan for the future as well. Bank North is, is slightly different. We're, at our core, we have um, a, a SaaS model. So we're working with some uh, global market leaders in the provision of cloud native banking software and platforms. So you saw some of the names in the uh, presentation, but the, the, at the core, we're, there's two elements. One is Encino, which is a, uh, a loan origination and loan management uh, software platform. And then Mambu, which is a German core banking platform. We've um, we, we're working uh, at a strategic level with those two uh, two vendors, but effectively they uh, are the ones who have to do the investment in those platforms to keep them live and up to date. And we benefit from the uh, from the investment that they make. So they spent hundreds of millions of pounds developing their respective platforms, and to remain competitive, they need to continue investing in them to uh, to keep them up to date. And we consume those enhancements as we go. The benefits to that are that as a early stage business, we are able to consume high quality, super invested uh, uh, software platforms. So that's, that puts us on a, at least a level playing field, but the, the bespoking that we've done to those actually, I think allows us to, uh, to deliver something that is more impactful than, uh, than the market would expect using those kind of uh, normal platforms. The second is scalability. So, um, those uh, cloud native SaaS platforms are infinitely scalable and uh, they scale with, uh, with Bank North as we, uh, as we go through the gears and roll out our regional proposition. So we don't have to do that constant investment in proprietary software to, uh, to continue our growth trajectory. We consume that on a very realized basis. Does that answer the question? Mark, Mark just to, if you don't mind, sort of throwing a couple of other dimensions. So I think. From, a, from an investor perspective, it's quite interesting because obviously one of the things that you've seen with you know, some of the fintech players and the neobanks is they've, um, you know, they've invested huge amounts in proprietary technology and in brand building. Um, and you know, they've, they've had been able to achieve magnificent valuations you know, as, a, as an, a, you know, unicorns. Um, the, in the banking sector, the, there is a question from an investor perspective now that's sort of turning towards, well, you know, the regulator is saying, look, I want to know that your model is sustainable. When are you going to be profitable? You know, what are the unit economics that are going to drive that? So I think, you know, that, that obviously we're a, a very different beast to that because we start with a profitable market segment of profitable products and it's scaling it up to, to become profitable on that. You know, that's where our valuation will come from, you know, in terms of generating returns as opposed to you know investing lots in accumulating customers and then you know putting a hope a future value on that customer relationship uh, nowhere from so then that's one dimension the other one is the reason why fintech enabled is because the lending we're doing cannot be done remotely digitally in an automated fashion uh, jonathan knows better than most that the smes uh, do not go on a in a linear journey, if you're lending a million pounds a time, you cannot do it via algorithms or as part of the portfolio and, and swallow, you know, sort of pretty chunky losses on that. And that's why people are so important to our business model. But we can use the best fintech technology to make them super efficient and make super decisions as well. All right. Well, you, you, you've given actually the perfect link. The, the final question currently sitting in the Q&A space is, it sounds a very exciting place to work. Uh, you have the pick of the choice of people. Can you say about, about what, how you go about picking the right people? So basically, HR perspective, how, how do you pick the right people? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I'm sure Dave will agree. We, we, we do benefit from being able to attract genuine talent. Present company accepted, obviously. But uh, some genuine talent into the uh, into the business, and um, it never ceases to amaze me how uh, how much of a draw that is, and how uh, 
how uh, we're able to engage with those people. So look, mo most senior hires will go through a pretty rigorous process um, as part of onboarding, uh, which will include uh, interviews with, um, with either Dave and, uh, and myself or even members of our board team, our non-exec team as well. So, uh, and we, we rely quite heavily on personal networks where those are uh, open to us. So um, we're a team of 25 execs plus four non-execs at the moment. The business will scale up to around 45 soon after, uh, after authorization. And th those hires are almost to a man and a woman identified and uh, those people are on standby ready to join us. But we've been able to get to know those people and they're able to follow the journey as we go. So we benefit from having a very rich pool of talent in the, in the regions, but we benefit by being um, a, a, a differentiated model in a market where the incumbents have been downgrading their propositions over some time. So we have attractions in terms of uh, a, a place to work and, uh, and an attitude and, and a culture as well. And that's something we're very focused on sustaining as we grow. I think I've answered the question. Does that, do you think yeah. I have? I, I, I think and we're virtually perfect in terms of timing. Uh, just as a reminder, obviously, if you've got any questions, you've got the email address investor at vnorth.co.uk, or you can obviously come back to us. Uh, we will be doing a uh, follow-up feedback form. We very much appreciate any comments which you're, you're able to give that. Uh, and with that, uh, Jonathan, David, thank you very much indeed. Very, very, very interesting. No, thank, thank you, Mark. Thank you to thank the you. team. Very much appreciated. Thank you.